Welcome everybody to Games Now Online Game Jam number four. And this time it is called Inside a Quantum Computer. So that's our theme. Also welcome uh, the hosts of the jam, which is me, Solip and Ville. How are you doing guys? Good, hello. Good. Are you As ready you for the see, jam? It's tiny bit sunny. Yeah, time. yeah, definitely. Excited about it. Yeah. So th this this time the jam is a bit different. So we do a joint kind of collaboration between two Alta University courses. That's yeah. the Quantum Games course and then the Games Now course. Yeah. And you you already seen Ville and Solip <laughs> in in both <laughs> of these, I guess. So it is a very natural collaboration yeah. here. We work as a team. Yes. So um, my name is Anna Kultima. I'm a scholar at um, a game scholar at Alta University, and we're doing all sorts of different things. But we also love making games, and we also are very much interested in quantum technologies and what the new kind of wave of computers can give for the game makers. Uh, today on this jam that everybody can participate on, you can just kind of lurk around and listen to also the things that our guest lecturer will be telling about the quantum games. Um, but here anybody can make a quantum game or anybody can make a game based on the theme that we have set for you guys, which is the same theme that the, the quantum games course has and it's called Inside a Quantum Computer. And this means that, um, well, well, we'll have an expert talking about what, what are the things that this could mean, but that basically I'm very confident that any of you can make a game that is inside a quantum computer one way or another. And uh, with online game jams that we run for games now, you can make a short jam, like a one hour jam or you can make a full week. So we will be back next week on Wednesday reviewing your games. So it's almost a week that you have for, for making a fantastic or whatever-tastic game <laughs> during this week and submit it for our HIO page. Mm -hmm. What are you kind of expecting, Solip and Ville, for our jam? What kind of games will we, will we see uh, based on the experiences of the previous jams? Do you want to go first, Villa? Um, well, yeah. Well, I, I didn't know what to expect. Well, good games, at least. That is, it's always be surprising how excellent games there has been and how well the team team has been used, although we have beat... The teams are not quite typical for game jams. And, no, yeah. yeah. But yeah, yeah, I'm sure there will be some games using quantum technologies or stuff like that but also very excited to see if there's something like a adventuring inside a quantum computer how about Ville? You, you've run a board uh, board game jam with solip last year yeah so are we kind of looking forward to also board games yeah hopefully yeah that would be very nice to have some board games or digital board games now that we are in covid time so people are playing online but yeah it'd be very nice to cook or card games or whatever and yeah, yeah. Yeah. And Solip, you have also participated. I think that um, for our sad uh, games, game jam, Solip, you also created a, a jam game. Was it that or was it someone else? I think it was the first one. So tutorial. Oh, tutorial. Was the okay. theme of the, uh, the very Ooh. first Games Online jam about tutorial. And I made a sad game without <laughs> knowing that the second, the next online jam theme would be a sad game. So I already yeah. kind of spoiled in there. I really enjoyed it. Um, actually, th definitely the online jam experiences could be slightly different from physical offline uh, game jam. Um, but then it also give us a lot of different type of opportunities to connect it with people or no learn new things uh, through online space. And fortunately, during this COVID-19 time, a lot of jams are now being conducted online and yeah. many of the tools are available digitally. So. Hopefully during this jam also we would see a lot of inspiring, experimental, funny, playful jam games that we can enjoy together in the long run. Yeah, that, that's very well put. And even though we are in this kind of completely un intangible world in a way when we're just sitting next to our computers, we have made sure that there is something tangible. So we have stickers again for you guys. So all of you that finished, uh, I don't know if it's kind of zooms in, but 
all of you who finish a game and submit it, and then maybe uh, help us to work with the research on on this uh, jam, will get a sticker sent to your home wherever you are in the world, as long as the the postal services actually work. <laughs> <laughs> so there are some restrictions apparently that we can't send everywhere like it used to be before COVID, but we'll try to make the sticker to, to your um, home. Uh, if you... It's a sticker version of the very, uh, the quantum cylinder that is right sitting right there. Yeah, to us, yeah, it's the, it's the Kriya star actually. So it's the one that is the, uh, the freezer for the quantum computer. Or we can, we can think about it is an actual quantum computer without its uh, cover. So maybe there is a chip underneath the, the Kriya star. So that's the graphic that our student from the production team has created for us for this jam. And you can get the sticker, which is a hologram. So it's, it's, it's perfect. We might also do a raffle of, a, of one of our caps from games now. So maybe, Ville, you have it at hand to show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it is. <laughs> like so that when the, the sun is coming up and uh, you have to cover your head, you will have a very yeah. kind of suitable merge from our from our course. Um, there will also be like a couple of things uh, that we provide for uh, participants of this jam. You have to join to our Discord channel though. So one of the things that will maybe help uh, in top on top of the, or in addition to the lecture things that our guest uh, uh, lecturer, James Wooten, will tell you as tips and tricks how to make quantum games. But we also have a preset or kind of pre-made asset package of 2D and 3D graphics made by one of our students, Nora Heiskanen, who was also part of the, the Quantum Games course uh, when we piloted it last spring. So uh, there will be, if, if, you, if you don't have graphic stuff uh, done or you don't have a graphic artist, there is also that help for you. So there's absolutely no excuses for not participating to this jam. And then we already know that you don't even have to know how to how to program in order to make games. So it's just, you know, you go for it. It's it's not difficult at all. But if you want to do like very ambitious level things, there is also that end. And that's what we will be exploring, hopefully asking interesting questions by Ville and Solib from our yeah. guest lecturer. Let's look at the a bit of the schedule before we go to the topic. So. So here we are. So there is the kickoff today. Then the submission deadline is on Tuesday next week. And then we have the review session uh, in a week. The yeah. review session, depending on the amount of submissions for the jam, maybe if there's like five games only, we will review all of them. But if there's like 20 games, we will have to pick and choose the, the most interesting and exemplary ones uh, maybe like diversity of the games and picked by perhaps James Wooten himself. Um, mm. So that uh, we'll, we'll talk about a bit how the jam went and what kind of things were done in, in terms of the different games. Um, we also have some schedule for the activities on Discord channel. So Games Now Discord will host a jam section where there is brainstorming, um, teaming up, and also like daily screenshot sharing, if you're interested to know how the games are progressing. And what else do we do there? There's also music. Yeah? Yeah. Are you asking, was that a question? <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't I was sure. I hoping that you fill in. Okay, so yes, we're also going to host a game music session during the weekend where you can just have relaxed coffee and game music, listen in, tuning in together on our Discord. So remember, it's not Quantum Game Course Discord server, it's a separate one. There's a Games Now Discord server. I will also share that on the chat where you can join in. So that's where the jam is happening. And that's where we're going to do the screenshot review, teaming brainstorming as well as the music session on the weekend. So stay tuned. Yeah. yeah. And what comes to the teaming is that you can have a preset team. We do kind of encourage you to also leave open seats for people that don't have teams so that nobody would have to do a solo jam if they don't want to. Uh, but you can do a solo jam as well. It's kind of, it's, it's much more kind of typical in online jams that people are going to solo jams. Uh, but it's, it's, I think that we are now like one year 
uh, in this kind of a, a fully online mode of many things so that we are much more equipped to do also social interaction in <laughs> in the game jam. So I think that the, for instance, global game jam in January was a really good case that we were able to facilitate yeah. and find people uh, for different uh, teams. So it's, it's so much more fun to do a jam game together with someone, but it's okay to also go alone. So that, yes, that's, we had that's okay. Very live, lively discussions on, on our Discord server and our previous jam. So don't hesitate to jump in and yeah. meet new people there right now. Yeah, and we will help you to come up with ideas and kind of at yeah. least to get inspired and then, then find your own ideas for, for your jam games. But do we have to cover something else in order before we kind of let our guests loose and talk about the, the wonderful team of uh, inside a quantum computer? Not at the moment, nothing come in my head, but maybe we can move on to the speaker and then we can get more information yeah. afterwards. Yeah. So if okay. we forgot something, we'll just fill in. And yes. those of you in the chat, just feel free to, you know, ask questions and comment and things and we'll lift them into the discussion. Yes. So here we go. Hello, okay. James. How are you doing? Hi, I'm good, thanks. Yeah. We will first try to introduce who James is. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so give me a few seconds. So yes, today we have Dr. James Wooten, a research staff member at IBF Research Ulick. Hello. Hi. And he's, uh, so James's research are related to making quantum computing accessible to newcomers and experiments with games in the context of quantum computers. So he's a very good fit for our jam today. And if you have been following games now, open lecture for a while, you might remember James lecture back in 2019 about quantum computers for game development. And for those who haven't watched it, you can also check his re recap video of this lecture uh, on our YouTube channel. I will also share that link on the chat in a few minutes. And that's about it. I think that's, we have great speaker today and I'm very looking forward to listen to a wonderful story of James Wooden. Thank you. Yeah. How are you doing? Are you excited, James, to, to kind of give some tips and tricks for the jammers yeah. to make the next generation quantum games. Yeah, so I've been looking through a few examples of quantum games that have been made uh, to, to provide a, a list of them that kind of bring out some of the reasons why people have been making them and how they've been making them and also try to find ones that are easy for people to actually play because no one wants to spend an hour installing weird stuff. <laughs> well, I'm looking forward to see what kind of games you have picked. Um, have you ever counted how many quantum games or how many games for quantum computer is there out in the wild? It kind of depends on what your definition is. Um, and uh, if you specifically want games for which some part runs on a quantum computer, then it's probably something like less than 10. Right. It's, a, it's, it's a really niche club of people who are actually getting a game to run on a quantum computer. But it, uh, what people do much more often is do use the software principles of quantum computing, uh, but emulate it. And then that makes it much more accessible and easy to make a game around. And for that, there's got to be like tens, maybe getting on for a hundred now. How about games that would somehow mention quantum, even though it wouldn't even be quantum, actual quantum physics? Yeah. Like that for must be a bigger group. For once that are quantum inspired, then it it becomes even more, even harder to know where to draw on the line. Like yeah. Quantum Break, that's got quantum in the title. Yeah. Was, then... was, was there a Quantum of Solace game? <laughs> I think that's a different quantum, yeah. Uh, but yeah, for that there's there's a great many. Even if even if you just res restrict to educational ones, so they're really trying to do something about quantum. People are, have been making these for a long time. Right. So, but I, I know that even like uh, Remedy's game doesn't really have like it's it's very much inspired by quantum, but they did use mm -hmm. an actual physicist to to mm -hmm. look at the, the the things and principles that are in the in the in the game. So. Yeah. 
That's kind of interesting in the field too, that uh, to find out that the different experts are used for, like in the movie business as well. So yeah. why not also game business? I know the guy who does uh, the quantum consulting for Ant Man, and he's done <laughs> quantum consulting on uh, a game as well. Oh, that's great. <laughs> well, I, I guess also the the circles of quantum is not that big, so you you would know the the mm -hmm. people that do that business. Yeah. Right. Should we let James to start talking about the categories that he put together? Yeah. That's probably a good idea. I have to just do this screen share and think, how does technology work again? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I should be sharing my screen now. It is It is shared, yes. And as you can see, it's a, a markdown file, which is, of course, the, the funnest way to convey information. And, um, yeah, so this is the way I've categorized the games. And I th felt it was it was good to categorize games in terms of two different criteria. One, in terms of how they are implemented, and then also in terms of why they were made. So uh, so the implementation is how they were made. And these are things that we, we were just mentioning. One is... Uh, uh, are they quantum because they run on an actual quantum computer? So is is the game really inside the quantum computer when it's running? That is one definition of what could be uh, a quantum game. But another is, uh, does it use the principles of quantum software? So when you're designing a certain part of the game, do you use uh, quantum programming? Do you write a program that could run on a quantum computer but you don't do that because it's kind of you've got to deal with a cloud service you've got to deal with the fact that you're using cutting edge technology and it's kind of easier just to use your own laptop if you can emulate it and then another is uh, was it inspired by quantum effects so did people just take some uh, idea that they know from quantum physics or quantum computing use that to inspire a game mechanic make a game around that mechanic, but otherwise not touch anything quantum. Um, and in terms of uh, why they were made, uh, people, so I've, I think it kind of mirrors how why people made games in the 50s and 60s. So why people made computer games in the 50s and 60s. And it wasn't really because, it was definitely not to make a profit and it was hardly even to be fun. It was mostly to be a showcase of the technology or to be educational. And so we're kind of in the maybe the 50s of quantum games now. So there's still a lot of that. People might do it just to, to show off some aspect of their technology, to show what it can do or what kind of effects are, 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 are present in quantum systems. So showing off the capabilities is one reason. But another and uh, quite an important one is showing off the limitations. Um, so people hear about quantum computers and they hear about how great they are and how they're going to do everything. Uh, but it's also important to to show that they they are quite limited, especially now we only have prototype devices. So why are these prototype devices limited? Why aren't they disrupting the world with quantum computing? So if you want to convey something about those limitations, you can try and do it through the context of a game. Um, and then the simplest use of all is that uh, I think if anyone knows anything about quantum, uh, they probably know that there's an aspect of randomness involved. So you can use the quantum computer to be a very fancy random number generator. So you can just make whatever game you want but when you want a random bit, you use a quantum computer. And uh, there you go. It's a quantum game. I would hope everyone aspires to more than that, but it's a valid path. I think it's a good starting point, at least. Like if you want to yeah. want to use the quantum computer, you make a dice uh, mm -hmm. out of it. So that's at yeah. least possible. Yeah, it's a perfectly valid way. And, and uh, we saw in a previous Quantum Jam, uh, the Quantum Wheel Game Jam, uh, which was uh, in, in, in the real world by the, by the big wheel in Helsinki, uh, that uh, 
one of the resources people had was a simulation of a Buzzer Einstein condensate. So proper physics stuff here. And some of them just said, oh, well, we'll just take the weird numbers it gives out and use it as a random number. And, you know, it used it. It was a perfectly valid uh, use of the technology. Uh, I preferred the one where they made it into a wave that you surfed on with some hamsters. But, mm, hamster you know, wave, yeah. Yeah, that was a better use of technology, but using it for randomness is perfectly valid. So yeah. at least as a starting point, that's, that's your first quantum game. Um, yeah. Cool. So then I've taken some examples of quantum games and, and looked at what categories that these lay, that these come into, uh, both in terms of the implementation and in terms of the purpose. So I think I'm just going to go through this list and I've chosen ones that can actually be played or at least hopefully. So, uh, this is one that's hosted on the QPlay Learn. Uh, website which it has a few quantum games including one that i made that we're not actually going to look at uh, but this is also a place you can go to investigate some quantum games uh, and this is called quantum tic-tac-toe so it's tic-tac-toe or well, noughts and crosses as we call it in britain um, but implemented with some quantumness so this is something that people do a lot uh, especially people who are new to the idea of making quantum games. They start somewhere that they are familiar and then they dip a toe into quantumness. So you can start with something you're familiar with, such as the game of tic-tac-toe. And then, uh, so here we've just got it on its fully classical mode. So classical in our terminology is the, the opposite, the absence of quantum. So when you're doing it fairly classical, you just place your noughts and crosses. Uh, here I'm playing both players, so I can't lose. Oh, there we go. One of me won. Um, but uh, then we can also turn up the quantumness a little bit, and we get tic-tac-toe, but with superpositions. So superpositions, well, if you're using, if you're putting quantum effects into a game, the two effects that are top of the list always are superposition and entanglement and quantum tic-tac-toe does both so so here i can just place an x as normal but i can also do a a superposition so circle here has gone for a superposition now a superposition on its own is just a, a source of randomness so on its own it's not all that interesting, and you could you could even you could argue it's not very quantum because it's just a source of randomness. But that's what it's being here. It's just a source of randomness. We've uh, made a move where we are randomly either at this point or at the other point, and we don't know which. Uh, but with the game mechanic that is being implemented here, um, you can't. So X's now cannot go where the superposition is. So that's a, an aspect of how this affects gameplay. So what can we do with an X? Well, let's just go there, whatever. Um, and then let's say circles are going to be quantum again. And uh, we get this effect. And now uh, there's, uh, okay, well, I probably, I didn't really choose very clever moves here because there's no way that uh, when the board fills up, then it has to decide where is where the noughts are. Huh. And so the, there's no way that you can actually be a, in a winning move here. So let's just complete this game and, okay, X wins. And let's play again. So you could get something like uh, X nought goes here, X is in one of those two places. Okay, let's say nought goes there, X places a couple of, oh no, I did that wrong. Um, but in, in this case, uh, yeah, I'm not doing, so basically, uh, you get these, these, these random things and it, it implements your, it, it affects your strategy because you've got to think, okay, randomly this could happen. So maybe I have to do this or randomly that can happen. So maybe I have to do that and it's going to affect the strategy you do. But it, it is the superposition here is just being introduced in a very simple way which is uh, in, in terms of randomness. 
the, but the, then you can this, this, sorry? The, the superposition is actually quite inspiring for other games as well that if we could use it so that 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 it like do i interpret it correctly that we could use it in other games as well that it kind of blocks things and then at the end of the turn uh, yeah. the, there is a there is a kind of a decision where the the thing is actually uh, manifested so mm -hmm. this could be a design idea for yeah. other than tic tac toe as well yeah uh, if that's the I correct hope... way of kind of understanding superposition yeah I will... <laughs> it was good good example really and it opens up the superposition a bit better also yeah yeah cuz if yeah. you well, if you were to do a superposition here and then the other one wants to do a superposition, as it comes up, that move requires high quantumness. So in principle, one the superposition doesn't have to block it. You could find ways around that, but it would be a lot more complicated. So if you want to restrict yourself to, to simple quantum game mechanics, then you do have a, a blocker there. Block. So that's what it's doing here. It's saying... Okay, the superposition, the way you have to deal with a superposition is with quantum tools that are, are beyond the scope that you do not have in your toolkit. Mm. It's not, it, the, the, that is not a button that you can press. Mm. So you don't have the ability to do those things. Uh, and then you, to keep it simple, you have, you're effectively blocked. Yeah. So this is like a classical way of understanding that what the superposition could be in a, in a game mechanic. Yeah. So you don't need the quantum uh, computer in that. And now if we go question. to... Oh, there was a oh, question from the chat, actually, mm -hmm. about this quantum tic-tac-toe. Is it runs on a real computer or on a simulator? Emulator. Okay, yes. So in terms of my classification, uh, I've got it as uh, inspiration. Mm. So it's, it doesn't run on a real quantum computer. In principle, it could, and uh, I've, I've spoken to the the, the, the the designer about this, and he was saying that he was thinking about how it could be implemented on a real quantum computer. But really, um, the, what you would have, what you have to do to reproduce these same effects in a game, uh, to make your own effectively custom emulator, is is much easier than than uh, like having to contact a quantum computer. So this is done in entirely uh, non-quantum uh, software, mm. but it's uh, reproducing these quantum effects. Mm. Great. Uh, so you have other levels here. And to be honest, I'm not so familiar with as much with how they work, but you can get uh, entanglement as well. And this gives you other restrictions on the kind of moves you can make. Uh, but with uh, entanglement, you also uh, have the ability to do more complicated. It, it still comes out as, uh, as as randomness, but it comes out as more uh, complicated correlations within the randomness. So it gives a bit of a flavor about what entanglement is, which is um, which is correlations within your randomness, basically. So with this, you, you start to see the basics of some of the concepts in quantum physics and quantum computing uh, in the form of a familiar game, such as tic-tac-toe. So this is something that you could start with. You could pick a game that you think you can make. You can look up on Wikipedia basic details of a quantum phenomenon. And then you can start to think, how can I put that game mechanic and that game together? Um, yeah, so that's the lesson that I think we get out of, of quantum tic-tac-toe. I really like the, the kind of the, the design idea here that it can be simplified. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that you don't have to like be a a absolutely accurate because it's quite complicated to understand. But also if you don't have access to quantum computer, or you don't know how to use it. You could still kind of go a bit towards the how quantum mechanics works. Yeah. Also because like it's a, it could be very complicated if you actually try to make like accurate simulation game or simulator for quantum computing. So mm -hmm. under like giving the theme or uh, concept ideas of how quantum computing works 
can be also delivered in the simple like tic-tac-toe type that's quite yeah. very interesting that's yeah. very good that's very good starting point so that so that people that don't want to do super complex things could maybe take this tic-tac-toe principle and then try to find like a like characters and stories that would fit into this mechanic that's that would mm. be super exciting yeah. to see and it's al always good good uh, option to take a familiar game and uh, modify it yeah yeah it's also good you modify the rules that is always a good option for yep. start development and mm -hmm. here is a game that James, you were part of making, right? Yeah. So actually, in this case, I'm trying to find games that uh, can actually be played in the browser easily. This one, you have loads. So I've given it a pass, mainly because I made it. But um, yeah, this is another approach to a game that is inspired by quantum, but doesn't run on a quantum computer and um, doesn't necessarily use quantum software. Uh, and again, it's uh, a puzzle game, because what do you do in a computer? You start with a state, like and it uh, may be written in binary. It says, what is one plus one? And then you, you find some ways to manipulate that in order to create something else, which is written in binary two. And so that's what all of computing is about, be it quantum or any other form of computing. You start with an initial state, you apply some basic operations that your computer allows you to do to process information, and you end up with another state. Well, what is another framework in which we can start with some state and apply a basic set of operations and end with a, another state, a desired state? Well, this is something that happens quite often in puzzle games. So even like a, a Rubik's Cube, you start off with a random state of the Rubik's Cube, you know what moves you're allowed to make, and you know what the desired final state is. Of course, I think I don't have to explain a Rubik's Cube. Uh, and then you have to solve the puzzle. Um, so similarly, we can do something like this with quantum. We can uh, represent the state of a quantum system in uh, like a puzzle board. And then the kind of things that we're allowed to manipulate that quantum system they can be the moves that we're allowed, and then we get given a final state, and then that is our puzzle. So this is what this game was based around. So uh, quantum computers uh, have quantum bits, so the quant uh, or qubits as we call them. Uh, so this visualizes what is going on inside two quantum bits, and um, the game, the puzzle board, is is uh, represents that the things that you're allowed to do with them the moves are basic manipulations that you can do on quantum bits and then you have a target state and an initial state and you have to press the buttons and and get there and in terms of playing this game i find that kids are better than it than uh, better at it than adults so it's uh, quite an easy game to play um but in terms of making a game maybe understanding the state space of qubits enough to make a game board out of it is not the easiest thing. Uh, but uh, you could also build upon some of the existing visualizations that people have made if you want to go through uh, that sort of a, a route. Um, so there's two forms of this game, one of it, which is Hello Quantum, which is the one that I'm showing you this animation of now on the website. And that is built very much to be a game. People download it, they play the game, and at the end, they think, hang on, wasn't this supposed to be quantum? Uh, and then if they read a blog about it, they can find out how it was quantum. There's also Hello Kiskit, which is a more unashamedly pedagogical version, which uh, for every puzzle, you have to read a wall of text first, and then you get to do the puzzle, and then you read another wall of text. I'm not going to go through all of this because I have already bored Twitch with the details Oh, sorry, excited Twitch with the details last week. So you can check, you can check that out if you, yeah. if you want this. So uh, but on, it, on our uh, Twitch channel for the Quantum Games course, the, the recording of James' session is still available. I guess is it really? I think it is. Yeah. So there is there, there is like a walkthrough of this, these uh, kind of a textbook examples of playing All the of same. Things. 
wall of text. Wall of text. <laughs> but yeah. yeah, um, yeah. But well, it, uh, if you like, run these yeah. things, images appear. So the only reason why images aren't appearing is because you're not actually playing the game. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's but also a learn, puzzle maker in there. You learn to uh, program for quantum computer with this uh, exercise, yeah. right? Yeah, so if you're looking for somewhere to mine to find quantum effects to to uh, inspire your game, then playing this game, it will be something that will hopefully inspire you to do uh, for the game mechanics that you can experiment with. Um, so I leave this for people if they're interested to go through. Um, but yeah, that's a resource. But maybe start with this version and then you'll be more forgiving of the walls of text. Yeah, also, Solip and I, we're working on a project where we are looking at games that would be embedded in text. So that's mm -hmm. very much an example of a playable concept that what we call this. So I think that as a jam game, you could even make a make an educational game that has text. It's, it's not a bad thing to have a wall of text and then a couple of tiny games to illustrate a point. So that's that's a good route too. It's perfectly valid. So like using a GIF or image, JPEG image or GIF next to the text. And that usually helps to understand more complicated concepts. So why not using game as part of something like that? Indeed. That could explain, supplement the wall of text, but a little bit more playful and enjoyable. That could mm. be also a jam game that we can explore together. And each is actually pretty good platform for that. So if you make your tiny exactly. game in, in your each page, you can have text on the page as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. At least for our experiment in Alta University with Playable Concept, we used HIO and then Google Site platform. So mm. put put games in the HIO and then wall of text on Google Site and then embed mm -hmm. the game from the HIO there. And that kind of worked. We experimented with research articles with games seems quite working so let's see yeah i like the textbook that you've made james it's a very very nice example oh thanks oh yeah and for all of your quantum needs check out our textbook <laughs> indeed we have, we will uh, put the links in discord as well hmm. for this yeah so i also i did put the link to this uh a file already in the discord oh but... right yes so yeah. all the all the people already in discord you can uh, kind of live follow this, or you can price, browse through and go forward with the, yeah. with the things that James is playing today. Yeah, so uh, I put Hello Quantum under inspiration because, uh, well, at least uh, the app version just implements these, uh, these quantum effects in its own way. It doesn't use any quantum programming, although Hello Kiskit actually does. So it's kind of ambiguous where it goes here. Uh, and I should also say that the uh, yeah, tic-tac-toe and um, Hello Quantum and Hello Kiskit, I've put in the, the capabilities um, theme as well, because these are here to, to tell you something about what quantum effects can do. Uh, but let's move on to the next ones, which are using quantum software. So these are games where there is quantum programs inside the game implementing the game mechanic. So if you want a game that has a quantum effect in, but you don't think that you understand quantum effects enough to be able to build your own quantum simulator, you can use, uh, you can write it in terms of quantum programming and use uh, a quantum computer simulator to simulate it for you. So uh, I'm, I'm saying that as if it's the easy option. Uh, it, you, you choose your hardness. Either you you don't have to bother using quantum software and you uh, do it all in ways you're familiar with, but you have to implement uh, a quantum effect in some way, or you don't have to worry about implementing a quantum effect, but you you get you learn about some of the principles of quantum software. And I, I what I like to say in making a quantum game is that one qubit is enough. So in a normal computer, one bit if you had a one-bit quantum computer, well, what is a bit? It's zero or it's one. So if you had a one-bit normal computer, it's zero or one. So all it can do is be zero or one. And all you can do to it is turn a zero into a one or a one into a zero. 
it would be entirely boring to use that in a game mechanic. But a, a qubit is has more in it than just a single bit. There's more things you can do. So if this is your first quantum game, then don't feel bad about just using a single qubit and exploring what's going on in a single qubit as your first game. Uh, don't try. You don't have to do any fancy quantum algorithms. Just getting used to the uh, the world of a qubit is enough. Anyway, this is just a. Uh, to make sure you don't try and do uh, too complicated. If you if you want to look at quantum software, don't try and do anything too complicated. Because uh, like if you can go to the Kiskit textbook and you can think, okay, what algorithm am I going to use my in my game? Ah, this this teleportation that sounds fun. And then you start looking oh. at the quantum software in here, and you think, okay, no, I'm I'm never ever going to go in the quantum ever again in my life. It does sound fun, but it does also look a bit uh, out of my range. Uh, well. Yeah. It definitely, it, it definitely catches my eyes. Teleport. Yeah, although this isn't too bad. I mean, you're only setting up the circuit. Anyway, this isn't even the worst. Uh, I should have I should have uh, gone <laughs> to, to quantum Fourier transform. So I these mean, be cool names for games and... It could be store-based game, yeah. quantum teleporting. <laughs> I mean, this is all you need to do if you want to make a game, you know? Oh, wow, how easy. Oh, no. I'm sure that some of our jammers are like, yes, that's exactly what I want to do, and it's just too yeah. easy. Mm. But for those, it would be way too complicated. Yeah, for those who are willing to experiment in such a way, then fair enough. But uh, I would not be expecting most people's first quantum game to be this sort of, I don't even write quantum software like this. Mm. And I've uh, been in it for years. This is uh, people who work in algorithms who mostly do stuff like this. Uh, single single qubit, that's enough by, by far. Anyway, um, let's actually get to a game rather than... What so this, this? this is called Agent Q. Oh, and, and it's so this done is, in Ludumdare. Okay. Yeah, so this was done uh, a year ago now. Uh, there was uh, Ludum Dare and also the, the IndyQ Game Jam, which was run at the same time. So this is a quantum computing meetup that had a, a Game Jam alongside Ludum Dare. So there's a, a few games in there. Mm -hmm. And most of them were made with the Pico 8, mm. which is this sort of uh, simple, well, you choose your, you choose your difficulty. But uh, it's uh, this very restricted... Uh, game engine so that you you can't do lots of fancy stuff you have to keep in terms of pixel art and you have to keep your game small enough or it won't it won't run um so Was yeah it's also the one that has its own uh, handheld device or is this a different one yeah you can put uh pico 8 games on on i think raspberry Pis. so people have made like custom versions of uh like a shells around the Raspberry Pi, right, so you can right, use it right. as a Pico 8 Game Boy. Mm. That's pretty cool. Uh, so this one is a game, and um, I don't know if I can zoom in a bit. I'm not sure if I can really zoom in, but you know, people can follow the link and do it I think it's themselves. Fine. Yeah. And no one can hear it but me, but nevertheless, I can hear it, and it's kind of distracting. <laughs> um, so uh, it's it's a nice looking game it's, if you if you if you like pixel art, which I do, and yeah, it it's uh, like Matrix, yeah. yeah, yeah, and it tells you about um, ideas of quantum error correction. So in order to make a quantum computer work, uh, you have to. Um, keep track, you have to keep an eye on what's going on in your quantum computer. You have to look out for things that are wrong and then you have to correct them. So it has a little bit of a tutorial where it tells you about quantum error correction and um, about some of the quantum operations that you use. So now we have to use a controlled knot. So it's, it's, it's uh, leading us through the process of implementing some uh, some of the basic parts of quantum programming, which is quite nice. So it's, uh, yeah, let's do that again. So uh, 
Actually, I think I'll restart it so I can circumvent the tutorial. Uh, but once it actually gets to the game, then it is a pretty simple game where you just have to keep track of weird things and and like it's basically like a game where there are bugs and you have to squash them. Mm. That's a kind of level that it's at. I'm going to do normal. So I have to look now for the odd one out. And if it's zeros and ones, I hit it with an X. So I did that. Okay. Now if it's pluses and minuses, I look for the odd one out and I press Z instead. Okay. I did it. So this is all based on ideas from quantum error correction. Uh, but in the end, when you're playing the game, you're just looking for these things. Okay, I'm going to hit that with a Z. Oh, and that, ah, what's going on? Going on. Uh, so you look for the odd one out, and you hit it with either an X or a Z, which correspond to the key on the keyboard that you've got to press. Uh, but all, oh, I had the wrong one. So which category was this on? Uh, was this? So the... I. Yep. Yeah, I've put this in terms of. Um, okay, I should probably stop playing it now because I put it on a too hard difficulty level. <laughs> These quantum errors are too coming. So I put this under um, limitations. Limitations, yeah. Because this is telling you about quantum error correction. It's telling you yep. about the fact that uh, sometimes in quantum computers things happen that shouldn't happen. This is not superposition, entanglement, complicated quantum things. Mm. It's sometimes a thing is not what it should be. Right. And we have to take steps to deal with that. And uh, quantum error correction is actually, comp can, as a problem, is pretty non, um, non quantum. Mm. In fact, could, I, could in I, this category also be, for instance, some kind of a game that like, explores why the quantum chip needs to be in a lower temperature, for instance? Yeah. So, uh, like, uh, your difficulty level is the temperature of your chip. If you if you weren't in a fridge, then you would be having these random events causing uh, errors much more often. Yeah, it's like something um, that, like, you have to paddle in order to freeze up your computer, and if you don't paddle enough, the, the, the mm -hmm. computer will give you wrong answers. Would that be yeah. kind of a game that would be in there? Yeah, so, well, as a basic principle, that, that sounds good, but, like, uh, I, I'd want to, if I was doing it myself, I'd think, okay, well, how am I going to actually link this to ideas in quantum error correction? Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, but uh, that was how I would do it. And then this I is completely, <laughs> this has reminded me of a, a game of my own that I, I uh -huh. did as a citizen science project back in, uh, back in, in 2016 where you've basically, you just have to basically and just as if everything's easy. But uh, errors come up and they cause, in this case, groups of numbers that add up to 10. And you've got to identify these groups and then push them back together again. Mm. And um, so this is, again, it's sort of, you have random events, but they're not everywhere, not huge it's kind of limited in their scope. And then you've got to try and figure out, like quantum error correction is all about uh, solving a puzzle, I would say. And the puzzle is uh, when weird stuff happens, trying to figure out what that weird stuff was mm. in order to undo it. So that is the principle of quantum error correction. Um, random things happen, but they leave a trace. You can find some trace of what those random things were. And then you've got to look for those clues. You've got to think about those clues. And then you've got to take the right action to undo them. Um, so it's, I think it's a, it's a nice theme for a game. And of course, I, I made a game and Vic uh, made uh, Agent Q. Um, to make the most insightful game, you probably have to have done a PhD in quantum error correction like I did. But I think you can still explore the ideas behind quantum error correction by playing some of these games that have already been made, like Agent Q and Dikidoku, and then thinking about how to put your own spin on that. Yeah, I would definitely do the the paddling for for freezing up the fridge because I, my PhD is only in game studies, so <laughs> that's my excuse, I guess. Well, uh, yeah, I, I I'm sure that I would have, have uh, equally hard time doing a PhD in game studies as as you ah. would have had doing one in 
quantum whatever I did. Yeah, well, uh, quantum stuff. <laughs> Can't it even was, remember now. I can tell that it was fun process. I'm sure that you also enjoyed yours. Yeah. Well, PhDs are, are PhDs. <laughs> I'm doing doctoral study right now. So yeah. Uh, You're the one suffering at the I moment. I need some encouraging messages. I mean, uh, I'm having the fun at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> um, and you don't have to have a PhD in quantum more games in order to make quantum games. So. Yeah. I'm sure that they're much better who don't kind of suffer for the PhD. Thankfully, yeah. yes. <laughs> uh, and okay, so uh, another one that was also from the same game jam and it's a Pico 8 game is uh, Keep Drogon Alive. Drogon. And you can't, this, and uh, you can't, you can't hear the, the music. Creator. It's the same creator from the game that we just previously... Uh, no, th so this was a different uh, person. So all of these games in this game jam were done oh it's very Caragua. Oh, what's we're, the name we're done by different people but um yeah it's uh, it's still using the, still using the pico 8 so that's it's very what pretty. Uh, yeah so here if you play this game you're not oh oh dear if you play this game it doesn't put quantum in your face you're like no one playing this game will know that it has anything to do with quantum unless they read the background stuff behind it. Uh, but yeah. the, the game mechanic is, of course, that there are these uh, arrows. And you've got a, you control a dragon, and there are arrows. And uh, you interact with those arrows in certain ways. So the arrows that are the same color as you uh, actually, uh, actually give you health. And the arrows that are a different color than you uh, can either do nothing or they can harm you. Uh, so this is a game mechanic that you could perfectly easily um, implement without any sort of quantum stuff. Uh, but the way that it is implemented is, is using some quantum stuff. So actually I have the Pico 8 uh, here and I think I can make this bigger. Um, actually, I suppose I could use this to actually run the game in a bigger way. Oh, I really love Pico now. Gives you very, oh, very kind of nostalgic it's feelings. It's definitely, yeah. it looks like one of those um, shoot them all ah. or like a uh, bullet hell like shooting Icar games. Is it called yeah. Icaragua? Icaragua? Yeah, it's like, you know, like in Japanese arcade games where you have to dodge oh. thousands of bullets. You yeah. have to survive and okay. you have to find a tiny, tiny pixel or glitch out there that where you can like, mm -hmm. survive. And it's kind of reminds me of that. And it doesn't look I like Ikaruga. Nothing. Sorry for all the all the Ikaruga fans that I I mispronounce <laughs> it, but it's called Ikaruga. Yeah. Uh, very much a very famous kind of a bullet hell game. Has but the same kind is... of color scheme also, like. <laughs> and yeah. it has a lot of fans actually it yeah. has a very strong band base in this genre yeah, yeah so here you see the actual uh source code behind it oh. and i did find the right bit of the source code before this um but okay here so here's a function run qc hmm. and you'll see it, it creates a quantum circuit it sets a register it adds quantum gates, it performs measurements, and these measurements are, depend on what the color of Drogon is and what the color of the arrow is. So this quantum circuit is implementing a little, tiny little single qubit uh, process, which has the effect that if the dragon is the same color as the arrow, then it doesn't harm him but if the or her, I don't actually know uh, what gender they, these dragons are, if any. Yeah, so it, it doesn't harm them. But if it's different, then it is random whether it harms them or not. Mm. Um, and uh, there's ideas about different f ways of extracting it, an output from a qubit and also what qubit states are, all going on inside this little tiny, so it's actually very small little piece of quantum programming it only uses one qubit uh but it's enough to implement the central game mechanic 
So that's the kind of thing you can do. You can you can learn one quantum program, and then that's your game mechanic. Um, that's how you're going to implement your game mechanic. So, uh, so, so, can... so was this in a category of of running on quantum software? Yeah. Oh. So this is a this is a category of running on quantum software, uh, and and oh, where did I put it? And that is the quantum software. Mm. That's well. You've also got to simulate it, so maybe that's so. That's as much quantum software that it, as is in that game, but it's enough to to be the thing that actually implements the game mechanic. Cool. So, so uh, okay. I th here comes a stupid question. So, mm -hmm. is this like, um, is it like a calling something elsewhere than is is it inside the Pico or how do you? Yeah. yeah. So Pico eight, you can't call anything elsewhere. This is one of the limitations yeah. that it gives. So uh, we have this thing, and I've put it down in. Um, okay, I updated this file and didn't didn't refresh. So I've got a few resources down here, and Kiskit is this. Uh, Python-based software framework that we at IBM create in order for people to write quantum software and either emulate it or run it on quantum computers, and it's awesome. But it's also a victim of its own awesomeness because it's kind of huge and unwieldy. So if you want to try and get it running on some interesting device like a microprocessor or in some interesting game engine like a Pico 8, it's never going to happen. Mm. So we have micro Kiskit, which is a minimal re-implementation. And so there's a micro Kiskit that can just sit inside your Pico 8 game and do ev and uh, allow you to create quantum software and then to emulate the effects of that and then give you the result. And it's all just in that one little package. All right. So micro Kiskit is the one that is working with the Pico 8. Yeah. It, it, you have to have them both in order to do this uh, call for the quantum circuit. Yeah. So you have to you have to install it, but installing in that case is uh, you go to the right file and then you copy and then you paste. Mm. So. Uh, and that's it. Yeah. Okay. That, cool. That's about it. Sounds so, like something that I even I could do. Since so this is, yeah, this is this is no, like copy paste though. Mm. No, that's not my crooked skin. So uh, this is this is the thing that enables you to do it, and you just go, okay, <laughs> copy all that, paste into my game, and if you look in uh, one of these tabs, then um, you find exactly he's just pasted. Oh no, this is the map one. He's just pasted in uh, mm. exactly mm. what I just showed you. Right. The, so then in, yeah. you can call this function. Yeah. Cool. And there's also versions for various other things, um, C++, C Sharp. So C Sharp one, you can use directly in Unity, mm. um, although we've got ways you can do Python in Unity as well. Uh, Ruby, Racket, people who like Ruby and Racket made those. Uh, I don't know. C++ is C++. And then it also runs on all kinds of weird Python, like, I don't know if I can reach from, from here, but I've got these little microcontroller devices and I like to shove quantum simulators on those so that it makes the uh, LEDs light up in in nice yeah, I am very quantum inspired that ways. Kind of thing, so, yeah. And there was a huge D20 dice that was made during the quantum oh. course last mm -hmm. year, wasn't it? That was from, uh, from, um, mm, what's it called, a uh, hackathon? Um, oh, okay. so it wasn't from a game jam. Oh, and okay. it's, it, yeah, there was Samuli and jo Jordan at least there. I think it was it also because uh, I physically saw the, yeah, I have I the physically dice. saw the yeah. device, yeah, and then the but LEDs. But it doesn't like it could be even like I don't know if there could be, um, Raspberry Pi and a sensor, and then you put that kind of a micro kiskit thing on a Raspberry Pi. Would that work, uh, James? Yeah. Well, uh, there is a if people, if you Google Raspberry Pi and kiskit, there are people who have also got proper big kiskit working oh, on a Raspberry, Raspberry Pi. Pi. Yeah, it's actually. Uh, but also micro kiskit. Like I think a nice thing about micro kiskit as well is that it 
is um, it's not just minimal in in terms of how small it is to install somewhere, mm. but it's also minimal in what it allows you to do. So with normal Kiskit. Yeah, there are so many fancy things you can do. I think it's easy for someone to think, well, I can't. If I if I don't use this complicated part of the package, then uh, it's because I'm stupid. I might as well not do anything. But micro Kiskit, the only thing you can do is uh, the simple stuff. And really, the simple stuff is what's most important anyway. Yeah. Uh, so it helps focus you on on the, the important things and and helps validate the fact that just using a single qubit, using the basic operations, that is all you need yeah. to start experimenting with quantum computing in a game. Sounds very good. Mm. I love it that you can you can take one piece of and just put it on the. Yeah, maybe I'm just too old for 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 fancy stuff, but I like the restrictions of tiny like micro computers and those kind of things. So it's, it's fun to yeah. create projects. And the, the Pico 8 also uh, gives you those limitations. You, you can make wonderful games with it, but uh, you, you, it's easy. I think it's easier not to get overwhelmed because uh, when you make your art assets, they have to look like this because that's mm. all you can do. Mm. Or, uh, and then Is you, it 16 oh, yeah. colors or...? Yes, yeah, so, uh, 16 colors. I don't know why I am scrolling over this uh, poor dragon. But, uh... <laughs> the dragon has like uh, golden pants and uh, eyeglasses. Uh... <laughs> like yeah. bear eyeglasses. Uh... Maybe I just... Anyway, we. Uh, I'll, I'll leave Drogon alone, poor thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, cool. Yeah, and so... I, there, was a, there was a Pico... Um, th there was a project on our course last year that used a Pico 8. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So if anyone wants to do that this year, then micro kids kit, uh, is, is the way to do it. Yep. Um, because there literally is no other way. Uh, and then the next thing I, I want, the next game is, is based on some basic research I'm doing into procedural generation. And I could go on for ages about why I think quantum computers are good for procedural generation and why they and why they'll be good in the in the future and why they'll be good in the past. In fact I gave this presentation last week on the other stream. So <laughs> check that out. Yeah. But what I would just want to show here is that you we have a process where you just take any image and here I've just taken an image of a few pixels. I should zoom into this should I? Here I've just taken an image of a few random pixels and you induce a quantum interference effect uh, just to give you some sort of texture out of that. So here I've got a fairly random texture. So this is not just random pixels, um, which would just be white noise. It's, it's more continuous than that. Where you've got black, you're more likely to have dark areas. Where you've got white, you're more white, likely to have white areas. So it gives you a bit of a bumpy texture, and then by... Uh, then I've basically used that to make uh, a textured island. And you can see a 3D uh, implementation of that island uh, here. So this is something that I, when I do quantum games, I usually just make a walking simulator where you walk around. Um, in fact, here's my walking simulator that I did for this IndieQ game jam, the one with the the other two games. Oh, lovely character. What is it called? Uh, uh, it's called? Uh, yeah, Benji the Blob. Oh, but... and, uh, <laughs> yes, it's exactly there. And the oh. player characters, this will be very small on the stream, but the player characters um, my, my daughters designed oh. to be uh, themselves. Uh, anyway, so poor Benji's getting a bit, uh, we we'll have to lead him to some food. But what anyway, basically. Them? Are they somehow kind of entangled? No? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, there's no obvious quantum in this game. Uh, it's just that the. the uh, the landscape that you explore as you go around is generated quantumly. And if we get enough time, I can give you a tutorial into how to make that sort of terrain. But anyway, so that's that's, that's what nice. I like making. Mm, right. So for Proc, where, where I've lost myself. For Proc Jam, which is a procedural generation jam last year, me and one of my colleagues, Marcel Fafalza, uh, made uh, this. So let's try and make it full screen. So it was taking this uh, blur effect that we call it, which um, 
basically you, you can use it to take an image and then make a weird blurred version of that image and then use that image as a, a resource in your game so uh is that 3d yeah, that's and so 3D, yeah. Here I've here we take an image, and maybe I should have dwelled on that a little bit more, and then we apply apply the quantum blur effect to that image, and it makes a 3D landscape. Mm -hmm. And when we were doing the tech t chest earlier of frame rates, this is the one I should have put up, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> but still, we get the uh, idea of it. Yes. Yeah. So, um, so you basic basically just uses this quantum interference effect to make a landscape which you can then explore. So it's a walking simulator, but the quantum is coming uh, through the procedural generation. Mm. So, so, I so the game could be anything themed, like nothing to do with quantum, but then, ta-da, oh. there is a terrain that is creating. Yeah, it's just it. using quantum-generated assets. Mm. Mm. Oh, also and, more uh, like inspired by or referencing quantum-generated something yeah. in the game. So then your terrain has come from inside the quantum computer. Mm -hmm. It's Ooh. inside. Uh, or you, you could uh, even generate a quantum computer from the quantum computer. But um, let's, Wait. let's uh, but even what? with my noise cancelling headphones on, I can hear my fan. So let us turn I, that one off. <laughs> I do have mm. my fan also coming to the stream, so don't worry about that. It's just my poor laptop <laughs> doing the OBS. Yeah. What are the benefits of you doing, using that for terrain generation? Funness? Well, yeah, <laughs> at the moment, fun is the, is the main one. Of course. Or, but uh, <laughs> yeah, in future, there's, uh, diff there's aspects of quantum computing that will help in solving the kind of problems that are, are useful in generating perfect terrain for a game which mm. makes sure that the game is solvable and and goes along with whatever goals that you set in the game but at, mo at the moment it's mostly for fun yeah um so i forgot to put down here uh, a link to quantum blur but I'll, I'll update that so you can just use quantum blur and then you're done and marcel also gave uh, an overview of how to use quantum blur but that was also in the stream last week so another plug so, back in time james have you played no have you played no man's sky uh i haven't because i i am too much of a nintendo fanboy <laughs> as soon as they port it i will so uh, I, i'm just thinking like how the how their project would be maybe in the future even like uh, the perfect that they promised if they mm -hmm. would be using quantum computers yeah so well i think quantum computers will be a tool that people will use in procedural generation in the future uh, now whether the the kind of problems that need to be solved to make the perfect procedural generation for a specific game will necessarily align with what quantum computers are good at is is another matter um but i think we will see examples of this in the future mm -hmm. um and even now people this quantum blur is being used by uh, an, an indie game studio uh, but it's more less because it's creating something unique and more uh, ex because it's, it's it's got a quantum origin so it helps to fit with the sort of sci-fi sci aesthetic that they've got going on right yep yep sounds sounds kind of nice uh okay so a few more games uh, this one is actually not one we can okay and uh, here's a game uh though it's not one we can play and i'm emphasizing those words because it's not it's, it's being very kind $2. to call this a game. So this is uh, called Universe. So this, these are the first ones now I'm getting to that run on actual quantum hardware. Mm. Uh, so this one is, it doesn't run on a quantum computer. It runs on a quantum random number generator. So using this for a random number is perfectly within the scope, the, the purpose of this. So it creates the quantum superposition. It observes it, and that causes it to randomly to collapse. Uh, and they've made it basically as a as a, a coin flip app. You tell this app you're going to either have pizza or salad for dinner, and then you play, and then you press split the universe, and then it contacts this quantum random number generator and tells you which. Uh, because this is there's this is interpretation. There, is there eight ball for with quantum. Yeah, 
<laughs> so it's a there's an interpretation of quantum mechanics called the many universe interpretation, which says it's not just randomness, but it's kind of like the universe splits into two, one in which one outcome happens and the other in which the other outcome happens. So it's a coin flip app which plays with this idea of splitting universes. Mm. Um, so it will also give you, uh, like, it, you've got this chart which tells you, you know, like, your history of using the coin flip app. And you can say, oh, there's where I, where another me split off and had pizza. And there's where another me split off and um, did, did whatever. I, I can't think of a very creative alternatives. Um, yeah, but it plays with this idea of... Uh, the many universe interpretation of quantum mechanics while also using an actual quantum system. So even though it's very minimal in what you could call a game, it, it, argue, it, it uses the quantum in quite a creative and fun way. Is, so, is uh, there any text adventure games? Because this kind of a splitting of universes is very text adventure-ish. So is there any yeah. text adventures, uh, adventure games that would be like the universe splitter? But uh, the, uh, Junye made one. So Junye is the guy who made uh, uh, the jo Drogon one. Yeah. So it's called uh, Wolfiverse. So this was made. Uh, so this is again. This is using quantum computing just for randomness. Uh, but it's giving you a bit of a text adventure, so it's I probably quite. To zoom in. Yeah. 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 So uh, then... you can check that out. Um, yeah, I can add that to the list of links. Yeah. Uh, but it, so it's using quantum as a random number generator, which uh, I, ha which is a perfectly valid way of doing it. Uh, but also, I hope everyone aspires to a tiny bit more. <laughs> but it's also perfectly valid. Um, so people can check that out as well. I'll, I'll add that to the list. Um, okay. So, so this was made by, well, with with what was this made by? What is the so tool the, here? Just uh, I think this is made using Kiskit. Okay. Uh, or maybe it's, it's uh, an inspiration. Okay, let's see. Oh, yeah. Implemented by a quantum circuit in Kiskit. So they're using right. Kiskit. And they've got a Jupyter a notebook which is telling you the details behind it. Okay. So, this is uh, this would be an interesting thing to also check for anyone who wants to do a text adventure. Like if you could mm -hmm. take it this far. Yeah, and uh, the main game was written in Twine. Mm -hmm. There we go. Yeah. So uh, yep, yeah, that is that is Wolfverse, which is a game that wasn't on the list. Mm -hmm. But uh, there's so many games, so. There are so many games, you are so right. So this this is another one that runs on a... So one thing about running on a quantum computer is that, uh, okay, there are only a few quantum computers in the world. Uh, here's a list of the ones that I have access to. So uh, that's what, four times uh, six, which uh, as your maths will tell you is not a huge amount. Oh, okay. well, it tells me here there's 29 supposed to be on this list. It's pretty. It's pretty high number for my kind of understanding of quantum computers. But if we think yeah. about the classical computers, this is like such a tiny, 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 tiny universe yeah. of computers. So there's there's quite a lot in comparison to what there was in previous years. So it's mm -hmm. it's, it's growing and growing. But uh, yeah, there's not enough for one person to play a game on in a dedicated way, uh, especially given the fact that other people want to use these devices as well. So there's usually a queue. So it's a cloud system. You've got to get in the queue. There's waiting times involved. So you don't want to be trying to use this every frame. Yeah. Um, and also you've got to handle all of the, all of like the login stuff. Uh, so one way that I looked at to get around this was to have a, a quantum game as a Twitter bot. Oh. And I will actually, I'll, I'll try firing this up so that it actually plays live. C can we like can we access it and somehow also participate, no? Yeah, so if you go Qubit to Qubit channel, twitter.com slash Qubit channel, then... Um, By I, the way, are I, we following the chat at all? Are we so immersed to the James's presentation? 
so yeah, yeah yeah okay good there's some discussion chats going on no worries great yeah yeah so i've 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 pressed go okay on the on the program so but we can look at a, a previous example so this is one that i just tried out earlier to check that it was still working so it tweets uh, this is a game of twitter versus a quantum computer anyone can play just reply in the tweets that ask you for an input mm -hmm. and we're playing against uh, th at the time that this was run the least busy device was uh, the one called mumbai um, as a reference for those of you who didn't listen or were not uh, at our course last week, is that these these computers are not in Mumbai. Yeah. <laughs> so they're just named oh. after cities, which is like I, I actually I would have loved yeah. it in a way that there is this network of all the cities where the computers are, but they are pretty much in one location. So there's this one here, IBM Q5 Yorktown, and that is the unique one that is in the place that its name is because Sorry, they're all they're all in Yorktown. Mm -hmm. So this is a town uh, in New York State. Oh. Um, which actually I've never been to because it doesn't have a train station. So how do you even get there? <laughs> um, but uh, I've been to the I've been to the lab that is lo at that local. Oh, I've lost the game. So what is it? Qubit Channel. I, I, you lost it, you didn't lose it, yeah, okay. So I, I don't know what to do. Oh, yeah, I didn't lose the game, I just... Uh, so it. actually, uh, it is running. So this one is um, against IBM Q Armonk, and it's saying the game begins with 12 marbles. So it's a game uh, of NIM, where you have a number of marbles, and then it, players take it in turns to take a certain number of marbles, and then the idea is... Uh, to take the um, the last marble, and so uh, it begins with twelve. You can take either one, two, three, or oh yeah, one, two, or three, and so you have to choose which what you're going to do. And now a Twitter user can reply with a one, a two, or a three in order to uh, in order I to take that number of marbles. Me too. So, uh, yeah. Okay, so as suggested by Anna Kaiser, two marbles will be taken. And now we're going to wait a moment for the quantum computer to take its turn. Sorry, Games Now and Villa, you were too late. Oh, <laughs> you lose. Maybe next time. Okay, our monk has not got much of a cue at the moment. It's responded already oh. by taking two marbles. So now someone can reply to that. Ah, refresh, refresh. <laughs> <laughs> So, and uh, with this, the games now Twitter account. So, you know me. <sighs> the solip is there. I'm not absolutely sure what I'm doing. <laughs> I guess so, I don't uh, know anything. Quite often, this also gets uh, technical issues, and that's what happened earlier. But um, but yeah, so it has to be a reply to this specific tweet. And sometimes when you use a bot to make Twitter threads, Twitter doesn't really like it. And it yeah. kind of it thinks you're a bot, which which you are, That's to correct. be fair. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So this is an example of us playing it. And it's a very simple game. And it's based on something called Dr. Nim. And um, so Dr. Nim was basically a children's toy from the 1950s where marbles ran down a little course made out of movable plastic parts. And those movable plastic parts basically uh, served as an AI that was unbeatable. And here the quantum computer is instead serving as the AI. So it's a very simple example of a, a quantum computer being an AI playing a game, but it has to be taken in the context of uh, it's, it's, you know, or you could also use molded plastic as a AI. So I don't know. Oh, yeah. So oh, Games no, Now has playing. now suggested three. <laughs> uh, our monk has responded with one. Games Now uh, has suggested one. So now it's got to a point where there are three. So Games Now took one. There are three left. And so now when 
the quantum computer takes a turn, it's able to take three yes. and it wins. Yes. Well, that so let's go through wondering. the history. Uh, so it begins with 12. Anna Kaiser took two. So then we were left with 10. Uh, oh, so Anna Kaiser took two. So then we were left with 10. But then Armok took its turn, also took two, leaving us with eight. Games now took three. And then Armok took one, leaving us with four. Uh, games now was not able to take four because that's the rules of the game. So it took one. Um, and now our monk will take the remaining three and win. It is a a game that can... Yep, there we go. We've played a game no. live against a real quantum computer and the quantum computer won one. because it was completely fixed. The only way that the quantum computer doesn't win is if the whole qu program uh, crashes in a bug. Uh, just because it's like a, a solved game and it knows how mm. to play. So resistance is futile. Yeah. Um, so where have I... I love to play games where I always lose unless the deck <laughs> broke down. <laughs> That's it. Well, so now I have to find my way back to my Markdown file. Back, back, back. Well, games now played with quantum computers. Yeah. So, um, yeah, this is something that runs on hardware and it's something that kind of shows the capabilities, but this is more that if you if you look at the uh, the code behind it, then you can understand that the game was implemented. Um, so, uh, yeah, I should also make sure there's a link in there to the actual code that if people want to learn uh, how that was implemented. And that AI, that unbeatable AI, was implemented on a single qubit, further underlying one qubit is enough. Mm. Uh, I wonder if the demo scene will have this kind of, I, I don't know how much you know about demo scene, but whether there is a niche within the niche of a demo scene where they do demos with quantum computers with one qubit. I don't know yeah. if you know that. Just came to my mind. Oh, it would be cool to see. I don't think anyone's done this yeah i have to notify the 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 the, the seniors that this is a this is the next step to take if you already yeah. explored all the one one kilobyte bytes kind of mm -hmm. things that you want to do in the world or 4k yeah squeezing everything you can out of one qubit i think <laughs> is a cool mm. Um, yeah, so then the last one on the list is Quantum Awesomeness, which is another game that I made. And I'm going to take a, uh, an aside into, into, what, into what it looks like inside the quantum computer, which is quite uh, important for this. Uh, hang on, where is... For, for this gem, yes. Yeah, so... So there should, uh, okay, our monk is a one qubit device. Mm -hmm. So uh, we wouldn't have been able to use our monk if we were using more than one, one, one thing. But uh, let's look at a, a bigger than one qubit device. This is Yorktown. And so this is a depiction of the, the hardware. Mm -hmm. So these circles are your qubits. They are your quantum uh, bits and um, these are where you encode your information. These are the things that you manipulate when you're making a quantum program. So a quantum program is is a list of manipulations that you're doing on quantum bits, and you can do manipulations of individual bits, which is everything that gets done in things like that uh, NIM implementation or the Jogon one. Uh, and also you can do implementations of pairs of quantum bits. Uh, so you can like do conditional operations where what you do to one depends on the other and so on. Mm. Uh, now there's a limitation to what pairs of qubits you can do these implementations, th these uh, two qubit operations too. And this is what this graph shows you. So if you want to do a two qubit operation involving qubit zero, you can do qubit zero and qubit one or qubit zero and qubit two, but uh, you can't do a two qubit operation with zero, qubit zero and qubit three because they're not directly connected. 
Now, there are ways of getting around this, um, but in terms of what you can directly do with the uh, instruction set of the device, that is a limitation that you have uh, with this. Uh, I have a maybe potentially stupid question, but or I don't know if you are able to answer, I don't know how this works, but are these mm -hmm. qubits in one cryostat or in several cryostats? Yeah, so this is in one and on one chip. So these are very physically chip, very yeah. close to each other. Yeah, right. Um, collected by little wiggly lines made out of superconductors. Right. Uh, so this is just a cartoon, but uh, the actual pictures of this online as well. Uh, so this uh, this has only five qubits, but they're quite well connected. If you compare it with some of the other devices, for example, um, Melbourne. So Melbourne has 15 usable qubits. There's one that's not behaving itself. Uh, so that's why it's, it's called a 16 qubit device, but... Uh, you only actually get 15. Now it's loading. There's also 27 on. ones. Yeah, so there, there's also uh, one that is um, 60, 64, is it? Or 65. So so this is with 15? Or... Yeah, so this is with 15. So you've got 15 qubits, and they're connected in this way. Uh, so some of the qubits are connected to only two others. Some are connected to three others. Mm. One of them is connected to only one other. So even though there's more qubits, there's less connectivity than Yorktown, which mm. means that sometimes people prefer to use Yorktown because it allows them to directly do the programs they want to do in a way that Melbourne doesn't. So there's a trade-off with these quantum devices. You have to be very aware of what the device is that you are going to use. Well, if you want to squeeze the best uh, potential out of it when using a real device. It's good to really know what your device is, where are the qubits, which ones can talk to which other ones, hmm. um, how many of them are there, and so on. And so so could, someone, could someone, for instance, make a game about these different constellations of the qubits in different computers? Yeah. yeah, so like these different constellations, as you say, are very important to how you write quantum software or how you transpile quantum software. So thinking about this connect connectivity is very key to uh, making quantum uh, software in the near future. So if you want to make something based around what is actually going on inside a quantum computer, what is very important at this stage of quantum computing, then you can just go through, because you can go to this website, it's quantum-computing.ibm.com. And that is a, that's mm. something so etched in my brain, I didn't even think to put it on the list. Um, we'll, because, we'll have it as course, a link. Quantum, yeah. Quantumcomputing.ibm.com. Yeah. But I'll put it in the in the links, uh, and you can do, you can look through all of these pictures and look at the different connectivities you have. Um, uh, but also, the, I really want to ask. I don't know why I'm so fixated with this, but I just try to understand how it is physically because it's in the cloud. We will not be able to see the actual computer. So is this yeah. also in one freezer or is it in several several freezers? I am not sure. Oh, okay. I'm trying to type IBM. I think some fridges have more than one um, device in, but uh, the the normal pattern is one per one per fridge. So here you've got the quantum lab, which has a few of these fridges. Uh, so the devices are sitting inside them. And uh, what I did want to find in here was also some pictures of the devices themselves. Uh, so I don't know if we, even if we put in Yorktown, it might give us something completely different, but it might. Okay, so this is, um, yeah, this is as good as we're going to get. This these is. Are, uh, these are available in Flickr for anybody, or are you? Yeah, these are available in Flickr. Okay. So uh, if you if if we ignore Jay Gambetta who's standing there posing with a website, and we look to the background, this these dark blue boxes are qubits, and these wiggly lines is how they are connected on the chip. So this is an actual depiction of Yorktown, I think, mm. or maybe one of its predecessors. Uh, and there's the actual picture that is the base of that. 
somewhere around in this website. There's, but there's, yeah, too many things to find it at the moment. Um, the, the chandelier inside, the one that gives the kind of a lower temperature is also super pretty. So it's, yeah. it's, it's cold, it's gold plated, is it, isn't it? Or what, what is the metal in there? In the yeah, so there's a lot of gold in there. Yeah. Um, so this is the a picture of one of these fridges. Mm. So this is just all of the lines that take the electronics down to the device. So the device sits at the bottom. Mm. Everything else is just about cooling, about interacting with the device, but the device sits at the bottom of one of these. It is similar to an actual kind of computer if you think about desktop computers because it's like it's a huge it's it's still a huge box in my yeah. mind and the thing inside is not really that but you need all those things to to keep the the temperature down yeah. and uh, all the it's other just... uh, like a power source and what el what else is there Yeah but in the same way this is the the, the most of the stuff in the in the box is something else than the chip yeah, yeah, uh, but it's uh, the percentages are even more yeah, <laughs> for yeah, a quantum higher. computer. Yeah, it's super um, big. Still, it's so, relatively small. But if we think about like how how to make a one that would have so many qubits in, uh, I don't know how many actually fits into one of the freezers of Creostats. But yeah, it yeah. depends on the size of the. It depends how much we have uh, given to Finland in, in terms of buying one of these things. Because, uh, <laughs> yeah, because it's a there is Finnish a one, industry. There is a one company called, um, oh, wow. I, uh, Blue Force. Blue Force in Espo that yeah. makes these freezers. Oh. The ones that kind of looks like the, the, the sticker thing that we have. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. To mm -hmm. remind the holographic sticker. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Sorry, sorry for the interruption and the fixation <laughs> right. of the actual physical boxes that these are. Because I kind of have to put it in my head that they exist in Yorktown in boxes mm. or these cylinders. Yeah. So uh, another aspect and one that's very related to all of the uh, cooling is that you will notice that these are different colors. Mm. And this relates to the uh, amount of noise. Mm. Oh, actually, this is. Um, this looks like it's related to the the frequency. No, I want it related to the uh, readout error, please. So uh, the minimum is dark and the maximum is light, and so uh, what this means is, well, basically, the readout error is how likely the qubit is to lie to you when you ask it. Are you zero or one? <laughs> uh, so this one over here. If you set it to be zero and you ask it, are you zero? It will probably tell you that it's zero. But this one over here is a right liar. It will probably tell you one just for fun. So it's uh, it's a it's quantum devices are imperfect. Um, they are they are so very fragile that you can never make it absolutely one hundred percent perfect. There's always going to be imperfections. Uh, as we saw in the the, the the quantum error correction game that we looked at earlier. And this is telling us exactly how imperfect different uh, connections are. So the, the, the colors of the connections tell you how imperfect those are. So this, uh, this connection or this connection are particularly bad in comparison to the rest. And also how much the qubits are likely to, to lie. Uh, when you ask them why, what their value is. Why are the connections uh, uh, kind of poorer? What, what's the, the reason behind that? Uh, so it can be all kinds of things, but um, yeah, you have to, you have to shine a, a microwave pulse down and that induces a certain interaction between these uh, physical systems. And sometimes it's just uh, the way that, that it, even I think even like the way when it cools down the, the way that it settles the distances can sometimes be a little bit off or the frequencies mm -hmm. are not quite where you want them to be so uh, is this so, because of the physical parts of the computer or is it because of the constellation or what is the what is the, the yeah, it's, a, it's a mixture of all kinds of things okay. so actually we don't have 
we don't make devices that are connected like this anymore because they're more prone to some of these uh, issues. If you look at the more recent devices, such as Manhattan, which is uh, our biggest one, then it will take a while. You'll see that the connectivity is not so great as it was. Like it's nowhere near as good as in in Yorktown. Mm. Uh, But the errors are a lot less. Uh, so the scale is different here, mm. but uh, yeah, the errors are a lot less. So you have a bit of a uh, a compromise you have to make between connectivity and noise. But so finding the best ten- way to build the quantum computer is finding ways to navigate some of these issues. Hmm. Whoa. Um. So. I'm here pretending to understand what, why they are like that, but still, it's it's fascinating that. Yeah. So you're making a lot of experimentation how to make them more reliable. Is that the, kind of one of the research things that you do in IBM? Yeah, mm. yeah, that's uh, interesting. The biggest one of the biggest problems. Mm. So what I made a few years ago was a game which I wanted to explicitly be based on um, what a device actually looks like, and also to incorporate ideas of noise. Um, so this is one based on uh, Röstlikon, which is a device that isn't online anymore. Um, yeah, and uh, I basically made it so that it's a puzzle game and uh, the grid that it's based on is explicitly based on the grid of the device it's running on. And it's made such that each uh, point has a number and these numbers occur in pairs and you have to find the pairs. Mm -hmm. So here it's quite easy. These two are 79. That's okay, done. These two are 93, another pair, and so on, and so on, and so on, and so on. It's pretty easy to go through and identify the pairs uh, because they've all got the same values. But when you actually run it on a quantum computer, you'll find that these values get a bit perturbed. So this is... Mm. This is uh, the results actually coming out of a quantum computer. These two are 70, which is fine. These two are off by one. So you think, okay, maybe those two are a pair. These two look like a pair. This 30 is nothing near the, that 91 and that 42, but it's closer to the 42. And what's going on with that 57 here? So you start to see that some of these qubits are a little bit untrustworthy uh, mm-hmm. because um, this is getting flagged up in the in the in the noise here so not only by just trying to solve this one little puzzle not only are you getting an idea of the layout of the qubits but because that constrains what the pairs are but you're also getting an idea of um of of where the noise is because that uh, affects how much these values are likely to make no sense at all uh, and also I, I come up with an error mitigation strategy, which kind of tries to remove the effects of the errors a bit. And it has the effect of making this 5779 a lot more sensible. But these two 70s have gone a bit weird. So, we've, so yeah, that, that was also quite interesting to me. But anyway, this is... Um, it is a so blog you can post. play this on an actual quantum computer when you run it. Yeah, so that mm. I made it so that you could play it live, but then mm. you have to have access and you have to wait a little bit of time between turns. So I also made a version where you could it it, it plays games and then just serves those puzzles up for people to interact with. And then once I'd done that, I also made a few of the instances into blog posts so that people could just do the puzzles sort of statically yeah yeah so that's a reason why this is a game that people can play easily because it's just a blog post where i've Mm. taken real results from a quantum computer and then put them in in the form of a game which doesn't have to have a live connection Hmm. Uh, this is a valid thing to do in the jam that you would take something that is not so interactable it's okay Mm. interactable So uh, yeah, this was so. This I think is, is this is an example using one of IBM's devices from a few years ago. But this was before I joined IBM, so I was quite happy to 
run it on other companies' devices as well. So this is a device from another company, and I, I'm just flat putting this up because it's got quite a different architecture. Mm. Uh, but you can also see how that architecture affects the gameplay because, uh, well, what's going on? It's obviously this is going to be a pair because that's the only pair it can be. Then obviously that's going to be a pair. And then that's four qubits that you've solved already just because the constraints of the device uh, mean that it has to be that way. Um, well, unless you add in a few little extra rules to make it a bit more interesting. Because, like, for example, in this in this case, there's an odd number of qubits. So one qubit cannot be paired to anything. In this case, it's that one. So these two are paired, and these two are paired, and these two are paired, and that's all quite obvious. But it, that's with uh, no noise. So if you start looking at a noisy version, you can see that this particular device was not having a good day when I ran this. Mm -hmm. So like, like, what even, do, what's going on here? Uh, but then I ran the error mitigation and that sort of cleaned it up a little bit. So uh, then it became a bit more playable after that. But yeah, you can use these, like even if you uh, only take inspiration from, from the data that you can find here of uh, what the layouts are, and um, what uh, qubits, uh, what the error rates are of qubits, then this is also a way that you can start exploring the ideas uh, behind what these devices look like, not even thinking about the quantum effects too much, but looking at the benchmarking and making that come alive so that someone who is playing the game can understand more about some of these uh, issues. Yeah, I think that people could just take the also these constellations and try to figure out how to like make make the uh, like different quantum computers visible in your game and kind of make the adventure uh, or puzzle adventure with the, with these constellations and make them you know I don't know how to explain that yeah. but you could get inspiration of these uh, images of the of the arrangement of the qubits. Mm -hmm. yeah. So maybe while I'm here, I can tell you another couple of things you can do in this website. It's got a graphical way of making uh, quantum programs. Although I have to interrupt a little programs. bit. We're kind of running out of yeah, time, we're running I out think. Of time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, guys are like, how how quickly do we want to wrap this up then? It's let's give it another ten minutes so that we are only five-ish minutes. Old. <laughs> James, do you have so much more still? Well, I I I've, I can see the time, so I kind of. I kind of got uh, spooked myself and thought, oh, I better show them these things. I know, there's so many things. It's very interesting. And like, we have so many questions. Yeah. So this is a, a graphical way to make your first uh, quantum um, program, which people might find a bit more accessible. Also, there's uh, a, a way you can run uh, Python. And if so with the Python API, you can also extract the exact numbers for all of these error errors if you want those rather than just looking at the uh, visualizations. What is this? This is just the last thing I was doing. Mm. Um, yeah. Uh, fortunately, there's no trade secrets on there. Uh, one thing also I did want, was going to show you was uh, we have this thing called Kizga, which is a way of making games in Python, uh, actually inside Unity. And uh, so I, I had a very simple terrain generation here, but uh, there's not enough time to go through that um, now. So I think we should just oh, not go so through that. I feel so sorry for asking oh. all these kind of uh, uh, no. questions. <laughs> but I'm but sure. uh, I can share the code. And uh, basically, this whole terrain is made out of a, a single qubit. Hmm. So... Uh, yeah. Maybe it's even better that we don't do it because it it, uh, <laughs> it it inspires people's curiosity. Now they want to find out. Yeah. So if you're working on Unity, terrain. make sure that you get this code. Yeah. So I will. Uh, I will share this. But um. Yeah. So. Uh, but that is the most important thing was to go through all of the games, and um, that is all of the games. So this is a game which I put under running on quantum hardware because it does. Well, it ran on quantum hardware when it ran on quantum hardware. But again, it could be just uh, creating an asset that you use later. And it also explores the limitations, which is mm. another purpose for making quantum games. Mm. Yeah, and that is that is basically 
some some games that use quantum computers and hopefully will serve as an inspiration. I am super inspired. I, I really would like to jam myself. Maybe I will find time to get inspired by the constellations of the, the quantum computers that IBM is offering. Uh, is there like, okay, asking from an IBM guy, but you also worked on other open computers. You can find mm -hmm. these constellations by Googling the other companies as well? Uh, well, it, it, it was always quite easy in the past. I, I'm not I don't sure. I if it's still there. Yeah. yeah, I don't know if it's still there. I haven't really poked around so much. Yeah, but you have, these are superconducting qubits that IBM has, um, which very always has these, these grids. Uh, but there's also ion trap quantum computers that people are looking into now where that is less in the in a grid like way but there, there there's different constraints like how many ions have you loaded into your trap and then yeah so it's harder to distill down into an image but with superconducting qubits that you should find for any company and putting the the, the coupling maps online somewhere hmm. That's like I'm. I'm so excited of, of what kind of games are now inspired by this talk because there's so many different kind of design ideas that we can get from these. Um, but what, what, James? What are you like? You said that you don't want us to use the computers as a fancy dice, like the true uh, randomness. Mm -hmm. So what are you kind? Of, what What is personally that what you would like to see most? Yeah. So uh, I would. I would. I think it would be interesting if people found some uh, p just a simple part of quantum programming, hopefully one step beyond using it as a random number generator. Um, so use. So for example, you can. Well, if I just if I just use this as a. Well, I can't zoom too much on this, but uh, in in this each each. Each uh, tile is, a, is either sand or grass or, or water. And the way that's created is that there's a very simple little quantum program which uh, has some parameters in it that are based on the coordinate. And then it gives out a probability that the outcome is going to be zero or one. And that probability is used as uh, a variable that decides what goes here. So you're taking variables in your game, which are the coordinate, and then you're getting a variable out, which is a probability, and it's going through a quantum circuit. And it doesn't really matter what quantum circuit you put in here, it's going to create something. So even if I just put the very, well, it's, uh, I'm not going to live code it actually, um, <laughs> because I'll, I'll just get stuck doing things that you can't even see on the screen. But uh, it doesn't matter what quantum program you put in here, it will create a valid piece of terrain. Mm. And so if you, if people um, use this as an example, uh, as a way of experimenting with single qubit or more, but it could just be single qubit quantum circuits, uh, using them to create some piece of information that can then be used in the game. Uh, I think it will be interesting to, to see what kind of uh, effects in the quantum programming that they find interesting. But this is me with my very much focus on, on quantum software being awesome. Uh, I should note there's also those other um, games that just use quantum as an inspiration, which is also a perfectly valid way of doing it. But uh, I would like to see people using uh, single qubit quantum software to come up with just some interesting ways to implement a game mechanic. And it won't be any better than implementing it in a far more simple and non-quantum way, but it's just interesting to see how you can squeeze game mechanics out of a single qubit where they're really not, that's not what qubits are about, but uh, it's interesting to see how much creativity you can get out of a single qubit. Solip, what would you like to see the students to do? And then the other jammers as well. Maybe not all of them are actually students. Hmm. Or Villa, do you have jam. something? Yeah, during this jam, what, what, yeah. Are, what do you personally are excited to see? Um, I kind of see myself as like artist. Uh, whenever I participate in jam, I usually do the 2D art and 3D part. Like, so personally, I kind of want to see some games that play around with these generators. 
mm. um, artistic assets, those like inspiration coming from the visual aestheticness of uh, quantum computers or mm. uh, art assets generated by quantum generators. I don't know. So those type of aesthetical things is kind of triggering me at the moment. Let's yeah. See. How about Ville? What what you are you inspired by? What would you like to see the chambers to do? I don't yeah, I, I actually started thinking that uh, it would be nice to see some more story-driven game based on this. Uh, mm. I don't know how how to actually do it, but somehow like. Actually, during the uh, small game making tool session, there was somebody on the chat mentions like, "Oh, like graphics novels about quantum mm. characters." Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. I am personally most interested to kind of see how the the Creo start would be used uh, in well now I'm very much inspired by the constellations as you saw but mm -hmm. but I am just the, the prettiness of the of the chandelier and the kind of the principle of the the temperature going lower there's a good website for instance by IBM that showcased uh, the, the the things on the the kind of level of the inside the the cylinder um, and and using these images for instance yeah, the, the chips that. and all that because it doesn't necessarily have to be if you are not into going coding inside the quantum computer. You could also take the visuals and make mm -hmm. the, the the levels or mm -hmm. make the um, characters based on the images that you see. So it's kind of inspired by the things that are inside the quantum computer. So mm -hmm. and if you want to, you could mash all these kind of wishes for of uh, all of us uh, for together to create the, this kind of massive, massive uh, quantum um, quantum computer game. But there's there's this is very insightful. I really love this session to mm. kind of uh, set us in the right mood and to different directions with uh, quantum uh, quantum computer yep. games. Yes. Yep. And that taught this type of inspirations. We have a brainstorming session, teaming session coming up yeah. on Games Now Discord. Um, so there's a link to our Games Now Discord server on the chat, on our Twitch. And then you can also find it in Games Now website. Uh, you can follow that link to join our Discord server where the actual jam is going to happen. And Ville and Anna Kaiser will bring the brainstorming session there where mm. you can freely discuss the idea and also teachers can give you guys some you know some tips or maybe our hope maybe uh let's see <laughs> yeah so thank you james we are over time it's seven past uh seven mm. that's beautiful actually um <laughs> But yeah, thank you so much. We are very much inspired and we hope that also the jammers are now super inspired uh, to make their their first or second or third or tenth uh, quantum computer game in this jam. So you can pick the, the time frame as well. So it doesn't have to be the entire week, but I'm sure that if you want to kind of mash up all these kind of different thoughts, you really need the entire week or even more, of course. Uh, but there is a possibility to make something very tiny and fitting oh, to your schedules be. in a Oh, I think short there was some freezing happening and then the oh. stream. All right. So, yeah, okay. <laughs> Should we wrap it up before this kind of wraps itself? Yes. My internet connection is unstable, it says for Yeah, I think it's yeah. kicking us off. The okay. Is it's kicking us off. <laughs> All right, so we will see you again with James in one week. And James is also in our Discord in Games Now server. Uh, see you there. Um, Solip is taking you with an introduction uh, task. We'll join in with Ville uh, soon enough. So yeah, yes. let's, let's do the jam and enjoy the creation of games for Quantum Computer because you saw that there isn't that many. So you can yes. be among the first ones. So final notice, uh, do join the Games Now Discord servers now, and then we're going to run the voice chat. And the voice chat is the place where we're going to meet each other and introduce each other and team up. So you will yeah. find the voice channel there that is active with me in it. That's the place you want to find uh, where yeah. everything's going to happen. Yeah. So and if you don't, yeah, if you don't have any idea yet, 
do joint brainstorming session, you will get <laughs> good ideas. And even idea. if we would already have ideas, it's good to think, good thing to yeah. to have like further ideas to explore more, uh, and you know, just uh, give it a bit of uh, space to think about what you are actually aiming for for the jam. So yeah, yeah. thank you, James. Thanks. See That's you. Jam. Good to be here. See you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Let's bye. Jam. Yeah, 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 yeah.